good to be in the house of God. Amen? Amen. I told you a few months ago that starting from April, I won't be with you always. Right? I will be assisting at another church, a number church, and so every second Sabbath, I will not be here, but I will be on the island. Amen? Amen. So next Sabbath, um, I will be there, and they are excited to, to have us there. They already line up what they want me to do. And I was like, at least give me a chance to at least, you know, get there first, but they already have things planned for me. But it's good to be able to serve. It's good to be able to be a blessing to others. And that's why serving, it's not a burden, but it's a privilege. Amen? And today, I think I'm Brother Anthony. was sharing with us what we've been really enjoying every single day uh, with the prayer, you know, the prayer group. And um, I believe the Holy Spirit guided me through our study to what we're going to be talking about today. The title is, The Good News About Confession. We know what confession means. We know That unless we confess our sins, God will not, and ask for forgiveness, God will not forgive us, right? But what is the good news about confession? It's about heights for prayer. Heavenly Father, you said you have given us six days. To do all our labor. On the seventh day, you said we should pause and worship you. Lord, we are right now in your house of prayer. We would like to pause. Pause to think of things that are still a worry in our lives like to pause and not think about our health. We like to pause and not think about our financial condition. We like to pause and not think about our broken relationships around. We like to pause and only think about you because you are the solution to all our problems. I pray at this moment that our hearts be opened, and that your spirit will come in, that you will take over me, and that you will speak to us in the way only you can do, and transform us, and lead us to understand the message today, but also to make a decision at the end. I ask all this in Jesus' name. The good news about confession. Is there any good news about confession? If there is, what is it? In order to understand the message of today, friends, we need, we need the comforter that God has promised us. We need the Holy Spirit to understand what confession means. 
I, I did um, a little bit of um, research, and the, 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 the definition of confession is this on the screen. It says, confession is the admission or acknowledgement of sin. As you confess something, that means you admit that you have done something wrong. How many people enjoy confession? I have one hand. Praise the Lord. Confession is one of those that you don't, you don't want to, to spend much time on it. It's one of those that you, you put in a, in a basket and you say, Lord, forgive me for all my sins, and that's it. But is that really confession as the Bible talks about it? But maybe sometimes, or someone here today may still wonder today and ask, if confession is the admission or acknowledgement of sin, what is sin? What is sin? Am I a sinner? Well, 1 John 3 verse 4 tells us, Whosoever committeth sin transgresseth also the law, for sin is the transgression of the law. In other version, it says sin is lawlessness. So friends, if you don't know what the law of God is, then you don't know what sin is. In order to understand what sin is, you need to know what the law of God says. And so, we sin when we break. Not my law, but God's law. The spiritual restoration is done by the Holy Spirit, who is here to convict us of sin, but also guide us into all truth. The Holy Spirit's job is to convict each and every one of us of sin. And so that little voice that you hear telling you what you just did is not right, or don't do that, is the Spirit convicting you of not breaking God's law. Many times we have heard that voice, but we have ignored it. Because we want to do what we like to do. We want to continue doing the things that we like. We are aware of sin, friends, by breaking the law of God. Anyone, the Bible says, anyone who be, belittle God's law shall never be able to reach confession. You know why? If you think God's law doesn't need to be kept, if you think God's law it's just too much. It's too hard to keep. You will not confess your sins, friends. You will not get to the, to the point where you, you will go to God and will say, Lord, have your way in me. Show me what I have done against you and help me to confess them to you. You won't because you think God's law is too hard to keep and God's law you don't need to keep it because Jesus has kept it for you. Confession takes us again to the sanctuary. Your way, O oh God, is in the sanctuary. And so understanding the sanctuary ritual and the sanctuary message is very important for us to understand how God saves us. How God restores us. In the Old Testament, when somebody sinned, and that person was aware of his sin, what did he do? Did the person delay and say, well, you know, yes, I have sinned, but 
Let me wait until the Day of Atonement when we know the high priest goes in the most holy place and cleanses the whole sanctuary. Then at that, on that day, I will be able to confess all my sins. Was it like that? No. Once someone sinned and he was aware of his sin, what did he do? He got a lamb and he took that lamb to the temple. Confession was very important to, to the people in the Old Testament. Why? Because unless they confessed their sins, unless they came to God, they will not be restored. And they will be cast out. When I thought about that, I thought about us. When I sin, do I wait until Sabbath to ask God to forgive me? When I sin, do I wait for prayer meeting to ask God for forgiveness? When I sin, do I, or do I wait for evening worship before I confess my sins. That's if you do have evening worship. Why is it so difficult for us today to confess our sins, friends? Why? Have you ever asked that question? Why is it so difficult for me to confess my sin to God? Why is it so troublesome for many of us to take time to search our hearts and humbly acknowledge who we are and what we've done against God. Why is it so difficult to say those three simple words, yet three most difficult words, according to to Herschel what Hobbes, he says, no matter what language a person speaks, the three most difficult words to utter are, I have sinned. And I thought about it. And I think many of us, it's easy to say, I'm sorry. But how many of us could easily say, I have sinned? But I wanted to check other languages and see if we can actually find three words that actually say, I have sinned. And so I went to Japanese and... This Japanese says, watashi wa tsumi o, if I'm not mistaken. Okashimashita. All right. My Japanese is improving. Amen. That's three words, right? Watashi wa tsumi o. Okashimashita. So, yes, it works in Japanese. So I went to French. And... It says, j'ai péché. And you can still count je, a, and péché. Yeah, so we have three, three words. I have sinned. But then when I went to Spanish and Portuguese, then it didn't work. It was only two words. And um, I'm not going to try 
Um, Stephen, could you read that, uh, the, 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 the Spanish one? E pecado. And Portuguese? Eu, eu pequei. Okay. So, two words. And then, I also tried in uh, Filipino. And I need a Filipino to read that for me. Is that right? I hope it's right. It's nag kasala ako. Okay. Kasala ako. It still didn't work, right? It's two words, right? Not three. Is it three? It's two words, right? Yeah. But anyway, you get the point. It's not about how many letters. It's about I have sinned. And when I thought about that, I asked myself, why is it difficult for us to really go to either God or someone we have hurt and tell the person, I have done this thing against you? It's so easy to say, you know what? I'm so sorry. Sorry for what? Tell the person what you have done. And it's so difficult to tell the people exactly what we have done against them. In the same way we do to God. And so I learned this with my wife. So when I got married, I um, continued doing what I do as a single man. And some things were not right in the eyes of my wife. So she called me upon it. And I was struggling deeply. See, why do I have to tell her that I am sorry? Because I thought I was right. But she won't let it go because unless we fix the problem, nobody is sleeping. So I had to fix the problem. And so I, I went with her and I said, honey, I'm really sorry for making you sad or angry but that didn't work friends she said you sorry sorry for what making you making me angry what did you do that made me angry you need to tell me what you did to me and so as you, you may think it's just easy you know just tell her but i found myself struggling to actually articulate and tell her in sequence how I got to the point of hurting her the way she was. And I was like, you are very tough, man. You know, you know, you know what I have done. Just, I'm sorry. <laughs> no. You have to say it. And not only that, she's so into details, she has to start from the beginning and make her way to where we are right now. Then when you do that, then she's at peace and we're good. Friends, I never knew it took a lot of effort for my tongue to express what I've done. And I believe it's the same way when you go to God. We think God knows what we have done. We think God reads our heart, our mind, and he knows that we have sinned. It's difficult for us to tell him, God, I robbed you today of that tithe I didn't return. God, I robbed you today of not spending time with you. How many of us do that? That I woke up, I was late, and I couldn't pray, I couldn't read my Bible, I ran to work. Actually, you don't think that's sin, right? Because it's not in the Ten Commandments. It is there, friends. 
when God says, thou shalt not have any other gods before me, he meant nothing else will matter above me. But you put that job above God. And that's what we do. But we never go to God and say, Lord, today I woke up. And instead of kneeling down and spending time with you, I chose my work over you. Please forgive me. How many of us do that? Sometimes you say, yes, I didn't spend quality time with God today. Lord, forgive me. But no, you need to tell God how you disobeyed him. How you chose that job over God. So by saying it, you understand what you're doing. You understand how God is hurt when you do the things you do. Go with me to the to the Old Testament. We're going to look at a quick story, a story that all of us know, but we need to understand something very interesting about this powerful yet successful king. 2 Samuel. 2 Samuel chapter 12. going to read from verse number one. Where are we going to? Second Samuel, which chapter? Verses one to twelve. The Bible says, then the Lord sent Nathan to David and he came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, one rich and the other poor. The rich man had exceedingly many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb which he had bought and nourished. And he grew up together with him and with his children. I ate of his own food and drank from his own cup and lay in his bosom. And it was like a daughter to him. The traveler came to the rich man who refused to take from his own flock and from his own herd and prepared one for the way foreign man who had come to him. But he took the poor man's lamb and prepared it for the man who had come to him. Verse 5 says, So David's anger was greatly aroused against the man. And he said to Nathan, As the Lord lives, the man who has done this shall surely die. And he shall restore fourfold for the lamb. Because he did this, and because he had no pity. He does not stop there. Then Nathan said to David, No, then Nathan said to David, Yes, you are the man. Thus says the Lord God of Israel. I anointed you king over Israel, and I delivered you from the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your keeping and gave you the house of Israel and Judah. And if that had been too little, I also would have given you much more. Why have you despised the commandment of the Lord to do evil in his sight? You have killed Uriah the Hittite with the sword. You have taken his wife to be your wife and have killed him with the sword of the people of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword shall never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. Thus says the Lord, behold, I will raise up adversity against you from your own house and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor. And he shall lie with your wives in the sight of the sun. For you did this secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel, before the sun. Friends, we know the story. Nathan didn't really know what was going on. 
But God revealed to Nathan what David did in secret. How does God deal with the problem of sin in David's life, friends? That's what we're going to look at. How did he deal with it? This story of David is, is scary, yet awesome. Follow with me. Why do I say the story is scary? It's scary because David did this and didn't feel like he has done something wrong. David did this and for many months or years, months, not years, months, he did not confess. Why didn't he confess? And as he was listening to the, to, the, to the story, he didn't even know that it was about him. And he was on fire. He said, no, this guy surely has to die. Because he understands that you don't do that. But he did not realize that what he did was exactly what this rich man did to the poor guy. Why did David miss that? Friends, it's scary. It's scary to know that you can sin against God, convince yourself that it's okay, and live your life for many months without even feeling that you have done something in the past. Why? Because you fixed it. Are we together? You do something wrong. You don't confess it. Because you found a solution to the problem. Is it because he married her that he made it right? Is it okay that because he legalized his fornication that now God will forgive him of what he had done before? Friends, the story of David is the story of you and me. We have stories of people who go into fornication and because they think they're smart, they protect themselves, nothing happens and um, they finally get married. And they think it's okay because now we are married. Friends, did you your marriage clear your past of fornication? No, friends. Sometimes we get a lady pregnant and we say, okay, now we, we got to get married because people will find out and it's not going to look good. Fixing the problem does not make it right before God. Even before fixing the problem, we're supposed to be on our knees begging God to forgive us and not do it again. But now, I'm planning to marry her, so it's okay. Let's just enjoy ourselves because the end result, we're going to be married and God is going to accept us anyway. Friends, that kind of thinking is already against God. It's a rebellious type of thinking that you can think that because you are planning to make things right, you can continue sinning without confessing what you've done in the first place that is wrong. And so David fixed the problem. Yes, he fixed it. Nobody knew. But God knew. And when I think about this, business continued as usual. David was king and he was successful. Until 
God decided to do something. That's the scary part of it. That you can sin and continue doing the things you do. You come to church. You lead prayer and praise and worship. You come to church. You play the piano. You come to church. You preach. You come to church. You teach Sabbath school. Yet, still things that you haven't confessed to God. And you think everything is okay because life is good. It's no problem. That's scary, friends. And we think we are with God, yet we are way behind. And this was the, 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 the condition of David. Now, the story is awesome because God did something. God did not want David to be lost, friends. God did not want David to think he is with him while he's not with him. And so God decided to do something. He decided to send his prophet to David. And Nathan went to David. And he told David straight in the face. That's you. That man, it's you. Just imagine, you got to be someone to tell the king that you. You got to be someone to tell your pastor that you. You got to be someone to tell the, 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 the conference president that you. How many of us have that courage? God is in the business to wake us up and put our sins before us. But the problem is you and I don't like that. And so when the message is preached, instead of humbly accepting the message from God, put your walls up and you reject it. When I thought about it, I realize that we do something that we don't know, that it is affecting our spiritual life. You know what we do? We pray and we confess our sins. But those confessions don't reach heaven. They're still right there because we do not confess our sins individually. We confess them as a formality. Now you cannot pray without saying, Lord, forgive my sins. Sometimes you say, Lord, I don't know what I've done against you today, but forgive me. That tells me that I did not spend time to search my heart, go through the day and see the things I've done that were against God's will. And God will not excuse that, friends. When you go to God, you go with a purpose. Can you imagine people in the Old Testament took the lamb, and there they were like, well, uh, little lamb, um, I'm not really sure what I've done. But you gotta die. Because I think I might have done something. So, okay, forgive me for all the things I might have done. And then you kill the lamb. Don't get me wrong. There was also a sin offering for sins that you did not remember. I'm not talking about those, I'm talking about. You going to the temple for forgiveness and not even knowing what you've done. It's time our confession is real and our confession is specific. You know what it does? When you kneel down and tell God that, Lord, I have this problem whether it be fornication, whether it be um, pornography or whatever, 
it may be, when you say it, it does something to you. It means you're on a journey to stop doing it. And you name that sin and you know it is sin. But when you don't say it, friends, you will do it again. And you will do it again. And you're going to do it again. Ellen White says, in Step to Christ, page 38, she says, True confession is always of a specific character and acknowledges particular sins. They may be of such nature as to be brought before God only. They may be wrongs that should be confessed to individuals who have suffered injury through them. Or they may be of a public character and should then be as publicly confessed. But all confession should be definite and to the point. Acknowledging the very sins of which you are guilty. When I say this, I'm not talking only about confessing to God, confessing to our spouse, confessing to our friends. When you went behind their back and you said something, mm, and they heard it, go and tell them, well, I'm sorry because I went behind your back this particular day, mm, in this particular um, setting, and I said this and that and that about you. Friends, <laughs> if you say like that, you won't do it again. But it's easy to say like, Marco, I'm so sorry. Um, I know the things I said um, really hurt you. Can you forgive me? Now, Marco has a duty to forgive me. Because I ask for forgiveness. But friends, I will do it again. When you start saying the things you have said, then you understand how it feels. Friends, we need to change our confessions. God wants us to understand what we do every single day so he can forgive us. And so, God sent the prophets to talk to David and tell him, you have sinned, David. And what I like about the story is that God doesn't say, you know what you have done? You know, no, he didn't say that. God started to teach him how to confess. And so God revealed everything. He said it. You took Uriah's wife, even named the name of the guy. The Hittites. He even added details about it. You took his wife and you killed him. Well, not really with your hands, but you killed him with the hands or the arms of the Ammon. Friends, God is teaching us that when he reveals to us what we do, he does not put everything in a basket. He mentions them one by one. You are a murderer. And you are an adulterer. God made it clear before him. And because the sin was before him, David had to act. Whether rejected or whether confessing. How does God reveal our sins today? When you read the Bible, it tells you what is right, what is wrong. And if you're courageous and you want to read the spirit of prophecy, uh uh-oh, don't go there. Because as you start reading, you see so many things you have to give up. You're like, ah, that's too extreme. Mm -mm. I'll just stick to the Bible. Why? Because the Bible, I can interpret it the way I want. I can pick and choose, you know. But the spirit of prophecy, 
means the prophet. God specifies the things that we do that are not his will. And many of us despise it. You know why? Because he puts our sins right before us. What did David say? 2 Samuel 12, verse 13, he says, So David said to Nathan, the three most difficult words, he says, I have sinned against the Lord. Amen. He could not say it. He couldn't, he couldn't say, um, I'm sorry, because all the sins were already, you know, specified. So he says, I have sinned against God. You can check out Psalm 51 and really see everything that he said afterward. It's a powerful confession. And we should also confess our sins the same way. David repented from what he's done. And he confessed his sins to God. And from that day forward, David was never the same. Did you know that? That confession, that repentance was real. And David was different. That's why in Proverbs chapter 28 verse 13 he says, He who covers his sins will not prosper. But whoever confesses and forsakes them will have mercy. Friends, we're not talking about just going to God and just naming what you do, but you also have to forsake them. A confession without a deep um, decision to, 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 to let go of that will not be forgiven. Those who receive mercy are those who confess and also make a decision to forsake those sins. It's interesting. Every time you preach about sin and confession and repentance, people are not excited. They're down all again, Pastor, talking about my sins. But Jesus came to this world to save us from our sins, friends. We gotta talk about sins because we are in this mess because of sins. And Jesus came because of our sins. And so we need to know what our sins are so we can actually ask a Savior to save us. So in the sanctuary, confession was happening right there. Every single day. And confession sets us up for a complete transfer of personality. And we clearly see this in the sanctuary message. As the person brings a lamp, and I, I'm going to close with this. Brings a lamp, he puts the lamp down. And he's kind of put his hands on this perfect lamp and he begins to confess his sins on top of this lamp. His sins are transferred from him to the lamp. And after he's done, now the lamb was carrying all his sins. And that innocence of the lamb is transferred to him. Would that work if he confessed 10 out of 11? Would that work if he confessed 3 out of 5? 
He has to come with a blameless, innocent, guiltless, above reproach, perfect, impeccable, faultless. And a friend of mine was telling me about this new expression for me, squeaky clean. I was like, squeaky clean, what is that? I found it. Yes, squeaky clean. Animal. Because he needed a perfect lamb to cover him. And you know, as we we learned this week, the priests were there, not for the sinners per se. The priests were there and they were checking. They were not checking if they were wearing jeans or slippers or if they were smoking. They were not checking that. They were there to check the lamps, friends. It didn't matter how you came or what you have done. They checked the lamp. And if the lamp was not perfect, they were rejected. Why? Because God only accepts 100% obedience. And that's the good news about confession. Friends, when you bring that lamb to the altar, when you bring that lamb and you start confessing your little petty sins. Once you're done, God does not see you. He does not see your sins. He sees the perfect lamb in you. And now he becomes sin. For me. That's what Jesus did, friends. When God looks at us, he does not see our sins once we have confessed them. Why? Because he sees the perfect character of Christ. That's the good news of confession. Because I can go to God and I can sincerely confess all my sins to him. All of them. And have Jesus now become sin for me. And I can take now his personality, his character, his robe of righteousness. And when I stand before God, God doesn't see messing. He sees his son, Jesus. And he accepts him. Amen. But friends, the bad news of confession today is that that lamb, that innocent lamb that the Israelites brought to the altar could not speak. The lamb could not read their heart. The lamb could not accept or reject them. That lamb is Jesus Christ. The lamb that we bring to the altar is God himself. And so I cannot fake any confession because he sees through me and when I lie, he's not going to give me his righteousness. That's the bad news. That you can trick that innocent lamb because he is Christ himself. And he knows your heart. And he knows if you want to forsake that sin. But if you really go to him with a sincere heart and you confess your sins to him daily, friends, you don't have to worry. Because Christ will take your place. Is there anyone today 
who would like to say to God today, Lord, it's been a while since I've really thought about what confession means and if it really matter. But I understand that unless I start confessing my sins to you and also plan to forsake those sins, you will not give me your righteousness. And today, I want to say nearer to you, nearer to Jesus, for I know He's willing. He's willing to become sin for me. He's willing to take my personality and be crucified on my behalf. But he's willing to give me his perfect obedience. If only I confess all Not once a week, not once a year, but every single time I sin. Is there anyone today who would like to say, Lord, I want to stand and I'm going to search my heart. If your Holy Spirit just help me and convict me of sin, I will confess sin. And I will ask you to give me the, the strength to overcome that. Stand with me. Jesus is at the altar. And he's asking, who wants his character? Who wants his perfect nature? Who among us? Confession, but also Repentance is needed. Are you willing to start confessing in a different way from now on? Are you willing to see sin as it is? And to say it not to just yourself or God, but also to the people you you hurt on a daily basis? The journey is long, but the destination is certain. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you for your love. We thank you for your mercy. For some of us, for many months or years, we've forgotten to confess some of the sins we have done against you. But Lord, just like you were to David, Lord, we pray that you may also speak to us today if we have forgotten any sin that we didn't confess. Lord, please reveal this to us. And help us from now on to really speak to you and confess those sins that we, we commit on a daily basis, but confess them individually, friends. Father, we don't want to leave this place the same way we came in. And we pray that this moment, as we confess our sins to you, dear Lord, that you who accept our confession, that you accept our prayer today and give us a victory over it. Help us to leave this place convinced that you have covered us with your righteousness for we want to confess our sins from now on sincerely but also with a repentant heart. May your will be done in our lives today and keep us in the faith until you come. This we ask in Jesus' name.